again, everybody, and welcome to Broadway Comedy Club Radio. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, here in New York City, joined, as always, by the legendary booker and owner of Broadway Comedy Club, as well as Greenwich Village Comedy Club, and the author of the hilarious and very informative new book, Did It on a Dare, Al Martin. Al, how you doing, buddy? Thank you, Clayton. How are you? I am feeling good after a good uh, cash game poker session yesterday, uh, playing <laughs> for money. Uh, you know, you always feel good. A win is a win, as somebody once told me. Yeah, absolutely. So before we bring on our guest, Al, let's hear a little bit about this poker game. Are you playing in-person poker during a pandemic? Yes, I am playing in-person poker. Uh, I've been concentrating mostly on two casinos down here, the Hard Rock uh, in Hollywood, Florida, and the uh, Coconut Creek Seminole in Coconut Creek, Florida, where I feel they take very good precautions. First of all, both casinos are located right off the parking lot. So you park your car, you walk into the casino, it, the, you're not walking through the entire maze of people wandering around with their masks on their chin or on their <laughs> head, you know. Yeah. And then when you sit at the tables, First thing they do is they sanitize your hand and then they um, have already cleaned the plexiglass and the seat and the rail from the player before. They have something called the clean squad. As soon as someone gets up, they call the clean squad. They disinfect. They do everything. There's plexiglass between you and the player on your right, on your left, and the dealer. And every, every few shoes as they go through the cards or whatever... They clean, they have a rolling machine that cleans the chips. So All I right. feel safe. You come back from the bathroom, hand a san sanitizer, you're wearing your mask. So very good. So I feel safe. Now, what are the players like down there in Florida? I mean, I definitely want to get to our guests, but I'm very interested to know who you're competing against uh, in, in the Florida poker scene in February. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, there are different types, you know, uh, as we know, and we identify them while we're sitting. There's the, the people that will uh, bet at just about anything with nothing and think you'll lay down. There's, there's the old guy sitting there who just waits for aces and kings. There's the old lady who sits there that when an ace hits the board and you got middle pair, you pretty much know if she's firing away, she's probably got that ace. Yeah. But, and, and, you know, and you got those various types and you just got to identify them at your table. The one thing not to get too poker uh, intensive on it is I really learned in cash games the, the real value in position, 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 position. Um, and it takes the hard decisions away from you. You know, when, when you're last to act, you got to get, you got to get either don't, when I get a hand, I analyze it right away. Can this hand stand a raise down the road? If not, I don't care if it's as good. It depends on the players. It's very aggressive. You know, uh, certain hands, I just won't, you know, you're Jack 10. I might, at an early position, I, I might not want to deal with nonsense. I don't know. It all depends on the table. Well, you know, a lot of our listeners uh, might not know that much or care that much about poker, but uh, for me and Al, it's always going to be something that binds us. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people probably don't know this, but Al and I actually met at the poker table in what was then called the Trump Taj Mahal right. in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, we were playing cards together. And at that time, I was a, a brand new comic. I was learning how to, how to do stand up and uh, Al was you trying to improve his poker game it turns out i said something that made him laugh not really knowing who he was he said hey you know something you're pretty funny i said oh well i take that as a huge compliment because i'm actually an aspiring stand-up comedian he said well you're not gonna believe this but <laughs> i'm a comedy club owner <laughs> <laughs> and this is how our friendship uh began so that's, was, that's a true story yeah, and, and we have a lot of other stories like that, but I think they're going to be have to they're going to have to wait for another day, Al, because uh, we have a a very uh, special guest today. She's a comedian that I've known almost since the beginning of my career. Um, she is one of the funniest people I've ever met. She's a regular at Broadway Comedy Club as well as at Greenwich Village Comedy Club. But today 
the big news about her <laughs> is not her TV credits or where she does stand up, <laughs> but this young lady is running for mayor of New York City. Yes. The first time hey. on the program, Stacey Prussman. How are hey. you, Stacey? Hey, so great to see you guys. And happy to have you here. And unfortunately, it's not in person like it always is. And I spent New Year's Eve at Greenwich last year hosting, and I've done your shows, that, you know, and we've done live shows together, and now we're on Zoom, but it's the way it has to be, right? Yeah, we have to adapt for the times. Now, Stacey, I assume, like most New Yorkers, you see the job that uh, Bill de Blasio is doing, and you say, well, I could certainly do better than that. Is that what inspired you to run for mayor? Actually, everyone thinks that's the reason, but that's actually not the reason. Um Many years ago, I was I was doing Libertarian Radio with Reverend Bob Levy, and uh, about four years, five years ago, I announced, I said, I want to do, be a mayor. I want to be the mayor of New York City, and they would laugh, and then they did fan art and all that stuff, but I really kind of meant it. So then, obviously, you know, I'm always running around, touring, and I never really got to stick my heels into the political spectrum. So then, guess what? The pandemic hit, and um, I talked to Larry Sharp. I don't know if you know who that guy Sure. He is the governor. He ran for governor against Cuomo in 2018. I met him at Compound Media and we were talking. I said, I want to run for mayor. He's like, and I said this about about a year and a half ago, the pandemic hit. And then a few months later, I was on his show announcing my, that I want to run for mayor. And then he's my senior advisor and, and the rest is history. And now I'm running for mayor. <laughs> yes. Great. And it all started with Reverend Bob Levy, who's also been a guest, a guest on our podcast. It all well, comes back. Um, just because we were doing radio, we, were talk we weren't a political show, but we were talking about politics. Yeah. And we were talking about, right, you know, I want to be, I, I, I always wanted that that job. I, we, as it was a joke back then, sort of. It was a half joke, and but it was in my subconscious. And then I said, I want to do it. So. Well, we've interviewed a lot of famous comedians, a lot of famous actors, writers, people behind the scenes. But Al, if I'm not mistaken, this is our first mayoral candidate on the on the podcast. Yes, I think it is actually. You know, we were, we we decided that uh, we're going to expand beyond just comedians and and get into a lot of different areas. And uh, uh, what better way to get a, a comedian that's actually running for mayor? I mean, actually, yeah, actually running. It's, a, it's a new you know, Stacy. So I think I first met you in the Montreal Comedy Festival, maybe in the early two thousands. Uh, we were hanging around, my wife and uh, myself and Freddie Roman, and, and you were at the table as well, yeah. which was a blast. But you've been around the comedy scene even before that, I think. You know, a picture surfaced. I don't know if you uh, saw this picture, but it surfaced from you in 1994 with Jackie Mason and Victoria Arnstein, another comedian. I don't know where you guys were, but you were hanging at a table. I, like, I didn't oh, even know she was there. I didn't know she. I knew. I, I have a weird. Vicky, I know since I went to camp, but I didn't right. recognize her at that picture. I knew Jackie. <laughs> it was just a weird connection. I knew Jackie when I did Grandma Sylvia's funeral. I was doing. Stand, I wasn't doing stand up. I was an actor, and I was just doing straight up acting, funny act. You know, like improv, but but acting you know, a lot of theater, and I was doing films. And I met Jackie through my producer. And so they, they would tell me to go and escort Jackie to this event and that event. And it was a whole thing. I was like in my right. early 20s. And so I, I was, Jackie actually put the, the, the comedy bug in my head back in those days. Because I was already doing like improv comedy. It's like, what are, you, what are you open up for me? I, I think he meant in more ways than one. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> He was wanting to open up for me, and I was like, uh, where? Like, well, I don't have an act. Like, I didn't know anything about it. Then, like, early 2000s, I started doing stand up. Like, I sort of picked the mic up, and that was the end of it. You know, I now, picked it up and you, it. you also uh, did some early work, um, I think, on, on a topic that's sort of near and dear to me because my sister passed away from it, but, um, you did some stuff on eating disorders, right, at one time? Yeah, oh, I still do. Um, I'm an advocate. I, I speak on eating disorders around the country. I, I'm an advocate for NIDA and um, a, uh, the uh, anorexia nervosa and other disorders organization, ANID. So I've been speaking um, for years on eating disorders and, and body image. And now I, I also went into health and wellness in terms of spe uh, speaking at that. I did personal training for a while, but I spoke about 
disordered eating was my my big uh, speech. And Mikey DiStefano got me into that back in that 2004. May he rest yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's something that my sister suffered from it. From I, had no uh, uh, I had no yeah. idea. I had no idea, yeah. From, from the age of about 12. It, you know, it's as you well know, it starts out as a, a, a mental thing. And, you know, I, I uh, in some of my research, I noticed the same thing happened to you that happened to my sister. And it, it was so untrue is that someone mentioned that she was overweight and that, you know, uh, it, it, it got into her head and she went on this extreme lifetime mission of purging and eating and purging, losing weight, having weird body images. I'd look at her and say she looked normal. And then, um, you know, she, she thought she had to lose 20 pounds and she was only like a hundred pounds. So, um, it, it, but the, the tragedy of that disease, it starts out very mental but then it starts affecting body organs and, and uh, they're not getting the nutrition. And she finally succumbed to a lifetime of that. And then at the last minute, she survived all of that and then got knocked out by COVID when she got sent oh back. Oh my God, to a, I'm so sorry. Yeah, she got sent back to a nursing home. At, uh, that's where the COVID uh, uh, hit her. And then that was just too much. That was the final knockout wow. punch. But um it, you wears know, so. you. it wears on your immune system. People think that, oh, just pick up a sandwich. Eat. It's, it's so much wor worse. It's like an addiction. It's like being addicted to heroin, but you're addicted to controlling your food to the point where you can die. And, you know, I've spoken at treatment centers where people have feeding tubes. It looks like a cancer stent, or it doesn't even look like it. You would never know these people are suffering from eating disorders if you didn't know about the disease. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, what I'm always impressed about comedians uh, and the truly successful ones is, their ability, Clayton, and you, you, you do this with your poker and and some of your other podcasts that you do, the uh, and and some of the um, performances you've done as Buddy uh, Buddy Holly and stuff like that. Oh wow! The uh, tremendous ability to reinvent ourselves depending on situations, you know, uh, um, and you know it's not all one cookie cutter, but that's what's great about stand up. It, you can expand into a number of different areas and still mm. pursue the stand-up. So I'm so fascinated by, by, by Stacy starting out as an actress, uh, doing considerable public speaking on on the topic of anorexia, uh, and also has a successful podcast career. I mean, she was at Compound Media, and uh, and she also was Artie Lang's co-host. Tell us a little bit about that on on his show. Um, I would go, I was uh, just a regular co-host guest every Thursday uh, for about, you know, I guess a year or so, however long it was, uh, back in 2016. And that was really fun. We, he'd crack us. I remember like going home from his show and my, my ribs were like so tight laughing. That I was like, oh my God, this is the fun. We had the fun. We had the, it was like so much fun. We just had so much fun. It, He's very funny off stage as well, He's right? So funny, yeah. I actually got on Stern a few times, but I, I think you remember being on Stern. I used to do, I used to do like, uh, I actually would come in if they, someone didn't show up, like if I get a famous person didn't show up. Ben, I was friends with Benji, and he would call me, and I would go in and do like a bit with whatever they needed. At the, so I'd be like, I use my improv skills. This was like in the early two thousands, and I, I kind of met Artie there, but he didn't really remember me. But then when I did start doing a show, he kind of remembered, and then. We would do, like, it was just, it was so much fun. I mean, he obviously had his demons. Uh, and that was obvious. It became more obvious as our, as the show went on. And that was kind of getting difficult too. So it was definitely um, fun to, to do. And I definitely loved every second of it. And I hope he's well. I haven't seen him in a while. And I hope he's and well. So now that leads us to your latest pivot, which is running for mayor of New York. So... What are you doing for us? <laughs> well, you know, first of all, um, I have a team in place. Uh, other than just my campaign, we have a policy team and we write about three times a week. And um, we're really dealing with what's going to happen in 2021. We're trying to figure that out. And we're also using what's going on now as writing policy moving forward. So, for instance, like we, we want to end the lockdown. Like I want to end the lockdown I don't think it's effective. I don't think it's helping anybody. And there's a way to open up safely 
without spreading the, the disease. And, and so you got, so we can have businesses back up, but, but you know, you follow protocols and people are okay. They're doing it in other states and other cities. Why not New York? Why we just have this, this, this haphazard opening up, closing up, opening up, closing up. Like I can't get a cup of coffee and a Dunkin' Donuts when my gym is open. Explain that to me. Yeah. It's very random and all over the place. I mean, um, I can't, uh, you know, I can't figure it out. I, a, a story I tell people, I went to Peter Luger's in Great Neck, Long Island. Uh, I went to Peter Luger for dinner. That's the one in Brooklyn, Al? <laughs> What's that? That's the one in Brooklyn? No, oh, this is, there's, there's one in, they do have one in Brooklyn, but not a lot of people know they have a second branch in Great Neck, Long Island. Um, and then three blocks away from Great Neck, Long Island is Little Neck, Queens literally three blocks apart. So you're seeing people, these poor business owners in Little Neck Queen, you know, setting up for the night. It was a rainy night. So now they're bringing in chairs. They have to take them out again because nobody can eat outdoors in the rain. And meanwhile, you could just walk into a restaurant three blocks away and, and, and it's totally okay. So I don't get it. Why is it okay in Long Island, but not okay in Manhattan is insanity to me. And it's probably the same patrons. Like they can just go over, you know, they can just drive their car or take a bus or, you know. Oh, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it why would you sense. go to the, why, do, why would you go to the Italian restaurant in Little Neck when you could walk three blocks and go to any Italian restaurant in the middle of the summer and not deal, you know, with heat and humidity and, and, you know, sweating while you're eating your pasta, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's re I mean, I don't understand the science behind it because there is none. That's why. There's no science behind. Like I live in uh, a gra like Gravesend area, but Bensonhurst is open. You know now everything is closed. But but the hair the hair salon I had to go like take a bus ride to the hair salon because it wasn't open. Like it, you know, like, and I it was like walking distance pretty much. You know, so it doesn't make like LMB was open, but the pizzeria by my house wasn't open because of the the zip codes. Don't get me started on LMB. I love LMB. I know. Well, I live. I should send you some. I live right here. By you know, I go, I go there all the time. I talk to the owners, but it's very interesting because it doesn't make any sense. So one of my plans is to open, you know, I, we don't know what's going to happen in 2020. We don't know what's going to happen next November, you know, or, or whenever, you know, we don't think it, it may not be open. Things may not be open. You know, well, at the rate these vaccines are coming out, you know, uh, it, it's, it's going to be quite a while. Well, that's all. There's just, just distribution is all a disaster. We did. We had a whole meeting. We had an emergency policy planning meeting about uh, vaccination distribution because we don't think that it's going to be done well by the time I would be elected. So we have actually a plan in place of how to get the vaccines effectively. Because if you don't get it the exact day after you get the first one, it's not effective. And it and so and one vaccine only lasts a few hours on your death, and the other lasts maybe. Uh, no, like one, it's a very short period of time, maybe 20 minutes, and the other vaccine maybe a few hours. But if you don't give those vaccines out very effectively and know the time of when you get, gave it from when you took it out of the refrigerator and when you get it two weeks later, it doesn't right. work. And it takes two weeks for it to work, by the way. So you're not fully vaccinated for two weeks. So you know, yeah. I'm learning all these things that I, you know, I'm learning all these things that I never thought I would have to know, but I'm learning them because if I want to, be an effective leader. I want to learn everything I can and come at everything with science and have a team of scientists and doctors on my team. So when we make these decisions, they're done effectively and urban planning because you want to have people be able to get to the vaccine, you know, in a nice timely manner so they don't miss their second dosage. Got it. Wait, yes. wait, so, go ahead, Clayton. I'm sorry. Yeah, Stacy. I'm just, uh, I wanted to jump in here. I mean, obviously COVID is kind of top of mind for all of us, but you know, you obviously wanted to be mayor even before the coronavirus was even a thing because you mentioned it many years ago, uh, kind of as a half joke, but not really a joke uh, when you were talking with uh, Reverend Bob Levy. Uh, what would you say to those who might suggest uh, you don't have enough experience because you haven't held public office before? Like kind of answer uh, those that might be naysayers, like that she's not ready to, to be the mayor of New York City? Well, I think that people have a misconception of what about me. They don't really know me. They think I'm just a girl that tells D-I-C-K jokes. Can I say dick on here? Dick jokes <laughs> on Bro at Broadway Comedy Club and Greenwich Village Comedy Club. And uh, let's get them open. Uh, so uh, 
No, I think that people don't realize I'm, you know, highly educated. And I mean, that also doesn't mean anything, that, but I've led, you know, I've owned companies, I've led, comp I've owned companies, led people. I've worked on uh, elect elections myself. I've worked for a bipartisan company called Headcount and we uh, helped register people to vote. We had one of the highest registrations to vote in 2012. I mean, I can go on and I'm an activist. I've been an activist for animal rights. I've been an activist for uh, the eating disorders, for human rights. And I've been working in the political spectrum for many years and I'm not as young as you think. So people think, oh, you're so young. I'm not that young. So I've been around for many years. I've worked in every industry uh, from you know the restaurant industry to entertainment to uh, businesses, and I've worked as I worked as a substitute teacher. I can go on. <laughs> and, I, and most importantly, Stacy, which is a few of the last few mayors we've had, you're from you're from New York City. You I'm were born, born in here. Brooklyn. I'm born in Brooklyn. I still live in Brooklyn. I live in Queens, in Manhattan. I used to do a TV show in the Bronx. And uh, Staten Island, I'll visit occasionally because they have a good bar there for the food. But that is about, that's about it. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a real New Yorker. I know how the city w runs. I know its problems. I've experienced its problems firsthand. So it's not like I'm some person just like, oh, I want to run for mayor because I'm a billionaire. I mean, what makes a billionaire more experienced is because than me, you know, it's hard to raise money. That's hard to donate. But other than that, I don't, you know, my experience as a leader has always been there and as a speaker. So if I could convey to the city, uh, you know, to the people of New York City that I am able to get get things done, that's what's most important. And I'm a person that likes, I'm a problem solver. First of all, if you didn't know me, I like to solve problems and I don't deal with political nonsense. When I, when I have, you know, issues on my team, I'm like, I don't wanna hear about that. Let's just get to the problem. Like a lot of people like to talk theory and this, I'm like, no, let's get to the problem. Let's solve the problem. Okay, so Stacy, let me, uh, right? yeah, let me ask uh, because you know you're talking about the the problem solving skills, which are obviously so important, <laughs> and in my humble opinion, really what's lacking in our current mayor here in New York. Uh, I'm I'm pretty vocal about not being a uh, De Blasio guy, so uh, it shouldn't be any front page news to anyone. <laughs> but besides the obvious COVID, what do you see as the biggest problems? facing New York City and what kind of solutions would you offer the voters for those problems? Well, I think right now, one of the biggest problems, you know, if you would have asked me this, you know, a year ago it would have been much different, right? Like a crowded trains, better transportation, you know, affordable housing, which has always been a problem in the city. Um, but now we're, you know, the McDonald's on West Third Street closed. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, when I, I mean, I, I, that McDonald's was open, I think I was in high school. I could be wrong, but I was definitely 20 years old. I'm not going to say how old I am, but that's many, many years ago. So I know I went to that McDonald's at 20 years old. I was there. And when, so when I think Mike Cannon posted that it closed, I saw one, he was the one who's the post I saw. And I was like, oh my God. And that's right by the basketball court and near all the comedy clubs. And the bars, so people would go there after they were drunk. A lot of homeless people would have their dollar menu. And uh, I would pee in the bathroom before I went to the train to go home after a long show. I'd get a coffee there before a show or, you know, or ice cream, whatever it was. But it's closed. What does that mean for the city? And that kind of really hit home for me because at that point, I'm like, if McDonald's can't survive in Greenwich Village, which is the only McDonald's, and it wasn't competitive with the other, you know, the small mom and pop shows. It served its purpose. It, it definitely served its purpose as a McDonald's. It serves a community. What is going on? What else can't, you know, what else is going to go next? Like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it was I scary. Two... I'm not pro McDonald's, but it was like very hard hitting. It was hard hitting. I have two questions here, um, which are um, very important to me. And uh, one is, because it really pissed me off with our current mayor. What's your policy on eating pizza? How? What is the right way to eat pizza? Very important question. You take the pizza, you, you um, squish it, uh, you know, you make it fold and you eat it and you put it in your mouth. Right. While you're walking, yeah. Will you you're promise walking. right now <laughs> to never use a knife and fork? I will not use a knife and fork. That is my main uh, 
platforms and never use a knife and fork when you have to eat a New York slice pizza. No self-respecting woman from Brooklyn would eat pizza with a knife and fork. So right. at least we could check that one off, Al. Yeah. She's, she gets a check mark there. What was your other one? Well, my other one, I think you're going to be asked this. Our idiot mayor answered the Boston Red Sox. But um, who will you be rooting for as a New York mayor? The Mets, the Yankees? The Mets. I'm a Mets, I'm a Mets fan. I went to a Mets. I, I, I live by the Cyclones. I watched the Cyclones when they were open. Uh, I support our teams. Um, you know, I you know I support all our teams. Like I think that that's important. I want to bring the Brooklyn Dodgers back. Yes, I think that that would be. I think that would be something that New York needs if they want to come back. Obviously, but um, <clears throat> I think that if we had the Brooklyn Dodgers, it would bring back a lot of good feeling and you know money into the city. That I mean, that's one of the major issues. I mean, what what's going to happen? A lot of people left. You know, hundreds of thousands of people left. I don't even know the exact numbers, but they changed. But they're high. They're high. Um, so much that I heard that we're losing. We can lose a representative in the Congress. That's how many people left. Yeah. So um, the businesses are closing uh, left and right. We hear about all these famous places that were open and now they're closed. Right. So what, what now, does that yeah. Mean? Exactly. Now, New York after this whole pandemic is going to be in a really bad financial situation because there are a lot of people not able to pay their property taxes uh, because they're not collecting rent from their tenants. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many restaurants closing. So obviously the tax base is gone. People spending money in local establishments. So New York's share of the sales tax will be um, uh, definitely diminished. So there's going to have to be a need to start thinking outside of the box on how to raise, you know, there's two ways to handle this problem, decrease expenses, increase revenue. Would you support casino gambling in New York City to raise <laughs> revenue? I don't see why not. I mean, if it creates revenue and people have the money to do it. My, I, I, used, I used to go to this casino in Jamaica when I lived in Forest Hills all the time. I'm not anti-casino. And I think it's, you know, something for people to do. There's nothing, I'm not, I, I'm not a, I, like I want to legalize marijuana and, and uh, psychedelics because I think it's a, it's a victimless crime and decriminalize. Yay! I mean, I want to decriminalize sex work. I mean, it's a victimless crime with two consenting adults. And it would also end sex trafficking among young and, 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 and increase, you know, in terms of sex trafficking, make sure that doesn't happen. You know, with young people. Now, where can, can we vote for you already online? Because you got me. I'm. I'm yes. I'm, I donate. <laughs> donate to the campaign. Gambling, uh, prostitution, marijuana. Well, I, I don't want to make you think I was a crazy person. That's but but these are victimless crimes. If two consenting adults want to have a transaction, that's their business. I want to uh, deregulate a lot of zoning because zoning is is ridiculous. A lot of it is. Some of it is needed, obviously, for nature. But a lot of it's just ridiculous. I'm sure you've had issues in your business with zoning. That's like, what is this? Why? Like, why can't I put the soda over here instead of over here? Oh yeah, yeah. I, have a, I also have a plan for uh, health and safety, which um, would you know how you get the A, B, C, D rating? This would also be for the to open up businesses during the coronavirus. It would you'd also get a rating on your health and safety. That's the only thing I would be regulating, so people would know what they're getting into before they go into a business. So if you don't, people don't wear any masks or they, or people are wearing, you know, uh, they're very, they're wearing masks and they're very protective. And they have a good air system. They get a very high rating. So it's a, it's a very, it's a, also another system I'm putting into place. So we can open up businesses and people can know where they're walking into, you know, and I want to add. I, I, I'm already digging this Clayton. Yeah, me too. My vote. Me too. Now, Stacy, another question. One of the uh, key issues facing New York actually since last summer is the steady rise in violent crime. So, I mean, you know, we had kind of all the riots last summer. And then uh, of course, you know, the calls for the defunding of the police. And obviously the current mayor has a, a very tenuous at best relationship with the NYPD. Uh, what are your views on uh, the role of police in society in general and what sort of, uh, actions might you take about trying to help uh, stem the rise of uh, violent crime in New York City? Um, well, first of all, I think that communities 
need to self-police as well. I mean, I don't mean to have like, you know, a guy walking around like, what's that guy doing? But local localized sort of policing within the communities. Karens. You mean Karens? Like Not Karen. Not Karen. No, okay. <laughs> People like where the police officers are in more involved in this community level of policing. But that's that's a separate plan. But so it, I think the self-responsibility is an important part. But in terms of violent crime, you know, there is this obviously, I don't want to BLM and, and uh, you know, that, that the idea of that movement is, you know, there is a systemic racism in our society and that that needs to be acknowledged and I'm not ignoring that at all but the police I don't believe in defunding the police they need to be restructured because they when I've speak I've spoken to a lot of wonderful police officers and they're like we're overworked we're social workers we're traffic cops we're this we're that we're you know policing every little thing we don't have the proper like for instance they don't have social workers when they go to domestic violence uh disputes or things and things could that could be easily de-escalated and let's say someone is being abused by their spouse, you know, where and they just go back into the home and then they end up dead. Like there's no one to make that discern, you know, that that sort of like to help that person out. Here's a domestic violence center you can go to or get help. There's nowhere to get help, and the, it, you can't just you're just leaving. It's like just putting a band-aid on a, 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 a bad problem. And that's about, you know, that's self, home violent crimes. And then there's like robberies and that is nowhere in our city, you know, being mugged or being shot. That's, there's nowhere that's not, that's not, that doesn't belong here. So I think I would want to restructure the police. So they're, they're much more apt at handing violent crimes, not bothering citizens over smoking pot or nonsensical things. And you have the traffic cops, obviously you want to keep people safe on the road, but you know, not over police people anymore. We're over police but yet under police at the same time. And, and I think uh, getting rid of some of these other things like uh, enforcement of, you know, pot laws or, or uh, gambling and stuff will free up resources to attack other problems. Yeah, I mean, there are bigger, you know, mental health in this city right now is going to be a major, major issue. We have to, you know, and that goes, and mental health covers addiction, it covers you know, mental illness and all that. And now people are going to have PTSD from the, the coronavirus situation being locked up. I know a lot of people probably won't feel comfortable leaving their homes. You know, they've been yeah. locked in, you know, they haven't really left their homes in a couple of months or a, now almost going into a year. How, how do they re-enter into society, society? Just like, you know, someone who's incarcerated, how, they, how do they re-enter into society? You know, I, you know, well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's amazing that uh, the current administration doesn't take mental illness uh, as seriously as they should, considering who the mayor is, you know, and I, I really don't understand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that should be a priority issue with this mayor. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, I, there's mental, there, there was, I heard there was a bunch of money that he gave his wife to do a mental health initiative and it just got wasted. And so I would, what, what, like, I think what I would really do is look at the monies that are there. And I'm sure there's a lot of pork that is just wasted. And like, why is it here? And also want to streamline a lot of bureaucracy. There's like, like you ever go to the DMV, for instance, and you have to go to <laughs> seven different windows. It's like, I don't, you know, things like that don't make sense. Like they've got to make, you know, I went to the Department of Education to get fingerprinted. And it was like, it looked like I was in an office from like 1945, except it had like, it had old computers. It had looked like, physically, it looked like something, it looked like my public- Horrible. They're, yeah. they're totally not updated in the way to do business properly and like you said streamlined it's crazy i mean have they ever heard of the term online doing a lot of these things online no they, i mean I new york have... city is the only city in the world that had off track betting they were the <laughs> only booking in town and they managed to screw it up and went out of business really? OTB. The OTB. my dad would go there all the time yeah uh -huh. yeah i probably hung with your dad there all the time <laughs> listen stacy if you didn't know already Anything you mention, Al's going to take it back to food or gambling. Okay. <laughs> he and, always does. <laughs> and politics. I do like politics. That's true, too. Yeah, good point. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to, like, bring more fun things back into New York, you know, just in general. I think there's, you know, comedy is fun. Obviously, we love comedy. Um, it's sad. You know, it's one of the great arts, and now we're doing it on Zoom or weird people are doing shows on rooftops. It's really, it's, it's sad. Like I was talking to our friend Janice Vicetti and she's like, 
she hates doing Zoom shows. She doesn't like doing, you know, not these types, but like comedy where you tell jokes into the. Into the yeah, it's really not the same. Turn into podcasts, basically. I mean, I you know, two squares. It's not to, fun. It takes the fun out of it. Yeah. yeah, it's not like doing. You know, it's nothing like a live audience that's just there and ripe, and it's you know you can't get it get that on Zoom. Well, you know, a very small percentage of comedians really make a lot of money doing comedy, but if you're gonna do it. You might as well enjoy what you're doing, and if if you're not if you're getting paid almost nothing and you're doing something you don't even like doing, you got to and and I've noticed a, a number of comedians questioning whether they want to do stand up uh, for the foreseeable future when it's only these Zoom shows. They're just not enjoying it, and they're not making a lot of money from it. So they're trying to pursue other creative ideas yeah i mean some people are in florida now they're doing like i know gina has a show in florida she does she's producing you know uh i mean florida is doing shows I, I i don't know what like in new york city which is the hub of i mean there are so many young kids i, I know that and clayton probably knows and al knows um that came to the city just to do stand up they're in their early 20s and they were like i want to do stand up and it's like they came here just to do that and now what? Now what? And they're going back home to Wyoming. They're yeah, they don't have they day from. jobs. And they don't have day jobs. Like, so not only don't we have stand up, like all the day jobs I ever have ever done in my life are like, they're not available. You know? <laughs> yeah. Not- <laughs> yeah. You can't be a waitress or, or a bartender. Or, yeah. It's very hard. And if Stacey is mayor, you won't be able to deal weed on the side. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's going to be totally legal. And dispensaries. <laughs> well, the more you decriminalize, the more you take things out of the shadows. I, be- I believe the less criminal elements go with it. You yeah, know, the more- I agree. It I makes mean, people- sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that it should be legal. No one ever died from weed. You know, I know that. You know, for the most part, though, you feel like you are if you take too many edibles. But um, no one's ever really died from marijuana. I'm, a, I'm not a big pot smoker, but I, I have friends that are, and they use it for medicinal purposes as well. You know anxiety it's better than you know some other alternatives so um you know who am i to be uh you know a mayor to be like you can't do this you can't do that you know it's it's not my business i want to stay out of the business of people i want people to live their best lives but you know and you know and le- and have and be and be not be a criminal you know as well and yeah, bring yeah. money to the city live because your best people- life and don't be a criminal now stacy i know that uh you uh, have some other stops here as you're very actively campaigning for mayor. But before we let you go, I wanted to make sure, sure you have a chance to uh, tell our listeners how they can donate to your campaign if they want a non-billionaire in the mayor uh, position here in New York City. Well, um, go to PressmanForMayor.com, P-R-U-S-S-M-A-N-F-O-R-M-A-Y-O-R.com. And there's a link that says donate. And the thing is, you don't have to donate a huge amount. You could just donate every month, $10. Or if you have a lot of money, you can give a big amount. But you don't have to, you know, even if, I know people are struggling right now. But if you have five, ten dollars $10 and you want to give monthly, like a Patreon, like they do in Patreon. But this is a antidote, which is a, specifically for the campaign finance board because we want to get matching funds. So if I, I raise certain amount of funds, then the city will match me and it could be huge amount. And I'm running third party, I'm running libertarian. And um, they're a great party and I love them and I've been with them for a long time. So, um, you know, it's a, it's time for a third party candidate. It's time for, you know, a mixed nonpartisan, uh, let's get things done type of position. And that's what I am. And I'm not, no, no one owns me. <laughs> Everybody say. go and visit pressmanformayor.com. And uh, Stacy, when we get a little bit closer to the election itself, we'd love to have you back on so we can check in again and see how it's going. Yeah, help? thank you. Thank you. I would love to. Guys, it's great seeing you guys. And I'd love to come back on. It's really much fun. Terrific. Al, any final thoughts? No. Nope. Uh, Pressman, StacyPressman.com. Let's do it. No, for uh, mayor, for mayor. Pressman visit PressmanForMayor.com. That's and- my comedy. See, that's the whole thing. I'm trying to market my... I have, you know, a whole life of, you know, StacyPressman.com. So I'm we're trying to match it together. But I, but Pressman for Mayor, go to Stacey. You can find me. My my campaign manager is going to put it up on the phone. We'll find you. We'll find, find you. Yeah, visit PressmanForMayor.com to make your donation 
to the libertarian candidate for mayor of New York City, Stacey Pressman, our old friend. So uh, for everyone here at Broadway Comedy Club Radio, for Al Martin, for Stacey Pressman, libertarian candidate for mayor, and of course, for our wonderful technical director, Jay Frank, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Hi, Al Martin here, owner of the Broadway Comedy Club and Greenwich Village Comedy Club in New York City. And I just authored a great book on stand-up comedy and my 30-year journey called Did It on a Dare, How I Built a Comedy Empire in 30 Short Years. So if you want an interesting story on the comedy scene in the 90s and early 2000s up until the present, if you're an aspiring comic and want to learn about some of my golden rules of comedy from a comedy club owner, this is the book for you. It's available on Amazon. And just go to Amazon, click Al Martin, and it'll take you right to my page. It's available on audio and Kindle, as well as paperback. Thank you.